All it takes is faith and trust. Oh, and something I forgot. Dust. Dust? Dust. Yup. Just a little bit of pixie dust. Don't forget the happy thoughts. All you need is happy thoughts. The past tense, past bedtime. Way back then when everything we read was real and everything we said rhymed. Why'd I kids being kids? Why did you stop? What did you do to your hair? Where did you go to end up right back here? When did you start to forget how to fly? Cinderella story. You want answers? We're on a mission from God. Inconceivable! Take your sticking paws off me! I'm afraid I can't do that. Have fun storming the castle! Hey everybody, welcome to the Story Cauldron, finding the folk tales, fables, and philosophies behind your favorite Hollywood films. I'm Bobby the Movie Dude. I'm Anthony the Philosophy Guy. And I'm Garrett, and I'm here. <laughs> and we are here to talk about movies and the stories that work behind them. Just like how Tolkien described in On Fairy Stories about the, uh, the, the natural evolution of stories over time, it doesn't have to be a conscious effort of a storyteller to reference something that came before, but if you've been raised in a culture and, and surrounded or steeped inside of a, a, a collection of, of ideas and tropes and characters and themes, then those are naturally going to come out and influence your new stories. And that's what happens with all of our fairy tales over time. That's especially what we're talking about today. And today we're looking at the story of a group of children who are kidnapped and repeatedly almost killed by a peeping Tom who forces them to fight for their lives against armed professionals. Yep, we're talking about Disney's 1953 movie Peter Pan. Peter Pan, that ruthless, heartless... Jerk. Something or other. <laughs> <laughs> Child? Um, no, uh, Peter Pan tells the story of the darling children, Wendy, John, and Michael, who are taken away on an adventure to Peter Pan's Neverland. As they meet mermaids, dance with horribly insensitive caricatures of Native Americans, and fight pirates, the kids, especially Wendy, learn the value of being a kid. So, uh, do you guys remember seeing this movie the first time? No. No. I was Like, it's always just Teeny, been there. tiny child. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, this movie... I, uh, this is one of those those stories that has deep roots in our cultural consciousness now. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. J. M. Barry was writing um, you know, over a hundred years ago, and uh, he he wrote it originally as a stage play, but uh, and then as a novel, and then Disney adapted it here in in the fifties. They actually wanted to do it earlier. This was, I think, the second movie that they had planned on making. But a few different problems happened, including, but not limited to, World War II, that really That's threw, a big one. threw a lot of wrenches in, into the works. And so it ended up being, I think, the 14th movie they made. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's been, this particular cartoon's been around for uh, almost... Like 60-some yeah, so years? Math. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember seeing this either. It routinely shows up on best movie lists from the American Film Institute. It, it is uh, for for all of the 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 things that we might want to feel awkward about or, or criticize. It, this is a deeply loved movie by a lot of people. Oh, oh yeah, uh, fun fact: Bobby Anthony, Bobby Anthony, and I. We all just kind of came off of. A production of Peter Pan Jr., which is Disney's Peter Pan for kids. We all came off helping with that. and um, Helping, yeah. Garrett was the director, one of the directors. <laughs> well, you were assistant <laughs> stage manager, and Bobby was one of the directors, too. So we know at least the Disney version pretty well. Probably yeah. at this point, when it comes to the music, a little bit more than I would care to, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was fun. It was fun, and it, it, the the sh the play is I don't know, it can be fun. It's got some some fun things about it. But um, when when you think of Peter Pan, what do you think of first of all? Uh, personally, I think Peter Pan syndrome. Okay, uh, which if you look up in psychology today and things like that, um, yeah, it's I mean, th basically just the thought of people kind of refusing to grow up and take responsibility and be an adult. Well, I think about like classic Disney storybooks 
because I think that's the uh, the original thing that comes to mind is uh, I don't remember seeing the movie for the first time, but I was constantly read the story of Peter Pan as a child. The like little those, golden book, like the little golden book type. Uh, things, and yeah. they have those those hardback pastel colored books. If I'm thinking, well, regardless, that, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. This is, yeah. they're like fully illustrated by Disney, right. and yeah, yeah, it's just those. That's what I think about, and then yeah. Of course, just not growing up. <laughs> yeah, I think because the movie's been around for so long, there there are, have been quite a few adaptations, and even, you know, before that, the play and the book, the novel, have been around for so long that there have been quite a few movies and and other versions of this story that have been told. So I know that uh, I mean, I was a little kid when I was introduced to Peter Pan, but I tend to think of one of the other adaptations first, which was. The the movie Hook from uh, yes from the what was it early nineties was yeah nineteen ninety one yes something like that yeah That's it. And with Robin Williams Ro- Robin Williams as a grown up Peter Pan so maybe we, we can talk about that later but that's uh, that movie and and Rufio and Julia Rufio! Roberts and all that yeah do you um have you got, have either of you guys read the book uh, I've read an abridged version okay. Before my wife would bring our daughters to see Peter Pan Jr., we wanted them to read the actual story, right? We wanted them to read the original story. It gets awkward when you start saying the actual story or the real story. It's like the Disney version is real, too. I mean, it's not the original Peter Pan, but the whole point of this podcast is that Peter Pan isn't really completely original either. Yeah. But before, uh, before we watched... The junior version, especially, we wanted one of them to be familiar with the original version. Ended up regretting that a little bit, <laughs> have to be honest, because the uh, the the book, the novel that that we read by J. M. Barry. Um, I mean, it was written for kids, but Barry had a very strange history with children and a very very unusual view of children. Uh, you know, he he was. He was writing these stories at, at the turn of the 20th century. The stage play came out in 1904, and the novel, novel was released seven years later. And they were, they were kind of the culmination of a bunch of different stories that Barry had told when he was a kid with his brothers, but also to a particular family that he ended up having a very odd relationship with. I, I, I almost said falling in love with, but that doesn't feel quite right when you read about the particulars of what what they would do he he had been married and his wife cheated on him and ended up leaving him um par- at least partially maybe because of his strange relationship with this this other family the the lewin davis uh, or D- lewin davies family <clears throat> um it, that was a family that had several children mostly boys and Barry would play with the boys almost like he was a kid. I mean, Peter Pan syndrome sounds like maybe the kind of thing that Barry himself would have been uh, seen as, as having. He's been accused of, of uh, you know, even more criminal kinds of, of actions, although the boys themselves denied that that ever took place, that he ever tried to, you know, force himself on them in any way. But that, that, that's probably about as much detail as I really care to get into. I mean, because it, 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 it feels really strange when you look at some of the uh, some of the letters that he wrote to them. I mean, even including lines like "Don't tell anybody about our relationship" and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that raises some red flags. Lots of red flags. Yeah. Uh, and and when you look at the book, you can see that Barry's idea of a children's story. Is very different than our view now, but but to be fair, it is it, it does follow in in kind of the the great traditions of bloody fairy tales from like the Brothers Grimm, where Peter Pan in in Barry's um, novel at least he's a kid, and he takes that very seriously. Barry does. He portrays Peter either not really understanding or not really caring about some of the things that that he does, Um, even when they're particularly violent and harmful. You know, the the whole idea with Peter Pan in Neverland is that they never grow up. The boys never grow up. The boys fall, the lost boys, they've fallen out of their baby carriages or fallen out of their um, out of their beds. And then they get whisked away to Neverland where they're never supposed to grow up. If they do grow up, Peter Pan kills them because he 
Uh, well, it, it's a little ambiguous. The actual phrase that Barry used was, he thins them out. <laughs> Uh, which some people try to defend Barry and say that maybe he doesn't kill them, but it seems really hard to uh, hard to read it. Otherwise. Well, especially if the Lost Boys are so big that they can't get into the hideout that he'll cut pieces off of them so they will fit. Yeah, that's another one. I got I got home from one of our practices, and 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 Jenny, uh, you know, my wife was was saying, "Hey, uh, so this was fun. Apparently, apparently, if the uh, if the kid's too fat to squeeze into the hideout." Yeah. Peter helps him out by cutting pit bits off of him. Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh, what a guy. Uh, but Peter doesn't, like, he's not doing this maliciously. He's not, because this, this is what kids do. I said he's heartless a few minutes ago. That's actually a word that Barry uses to describe him. That, that, really? Uh, that he, that, well, to describe all children, that they are heartless because children are very selfish. They're, they're naturally, they think of themselves, not because they're evil, it's just because they're kids. They just don't. They haven't learned yet to care about other creatures um, in the same way that, that we do as when we're older. And um, th- that's not to say that they're, you know, necessarily violent or that all kids are going to start chopping bits off of their friends. Yeah. But, you know, if they don't like something, then they, they, they haven't necessarily learned that they might not get it back. Here, here's something else that happens. There's this belief in Neverland in the book that with every breath you take an adult dies. Every breath you breathe in Neverland, an adult dies in the real world or in the normal world. And so there's this part where they go Everyone's back. holding their breaths. Yeah, they, that, that got dark. Not there. Peter. They oh. go back into the hideout and he starts breathing really fast because he thinks it's a fun game and he doesn't care that, that people might be dying because he's he doesn't think about anything outside of himself because he's really just a kid. Uh, and so it might be kind of Woof. an odd way to tell a story but Barry, maybe it's because he had such a weird relationship with kids. He was so close to this family. He he kind of has a weird, weird understanding. weirdly accurate, yeah, weird weird insight into how how they're working. But uh, and, and to say nothing about all, all the rest with having these kids fight grown pirates. Yeah, that's and uh, cut their hands off and things. Yeah, that's that's something that you want your kids to <laughs> mimic, <laughs> right? Well, the first time that you actually see Peter Pan show up, isn't it in uh, The Little White Bird? Oh, well, yeah, that, the, that's the first story that, um, that Barry kind of told. Because I didn't really realize that um, Peter Pan was in more than just Peter and Wendy and uh, Peter and Kesing- Kensington Gardens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never really realized that until I started looking into the story for this podcast that we're doing. Yeah, I think uh, he was kind of like the story that Barry would tell people. He was like his pet, kind of like um, Winnie the Pooh. You know, was the, were the stories that A. A. Milne, Milna. I never know how to pronounce his name, but you know, the creator of Winnie the Pooh would tell these stories to his kid, Christopher Robin, and then they got collected into, into Winnie the, book. the Pooh. And and similarly too, kind of, um, you can tell a similar story about the Hobbit and Tolkien telling stories to his son Christopher. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Peter mm-hmm. Pan was kind of Barry's version of, of that, but it really, it's, yeah, like you said, Peter and Wendy, where it starts to get, take on the color we, we see today and, and you see in other kinds of adaptations too. Hmm. So, so we've talked about the, uh, the original no- novel and play a little bit in, uh, J.M. Barry's Pan, um, but there's even like some farther back references to, a pan, not necessarily the same pan, but a um, pan, a not pan, the pan, but a pan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in Greek mythology. So I know a little bit about this. In fact, there was, uh, there's another adaptation, uh, telling of the story of Peter Pan where he walks in and he's like a satyr and he nibbles on kids' hands. Um, how <laughs> and when you say nibble, do you mean like he just straight up or? eats their hands? Yeah, he's munching on, on <laughs> he's eating pop body one. parts, <laughs> but yeah, he's uh, I guess like a wild god and companion to uh, the some. god of the woodlands, god of the woodlands. Okay, um, so yeah, and he w- he was a pan, right? And uh, whenever I, I hear that, I think of like the uh, the pan flute, you know, sure, yeah, well, there that there's the story about. Pan creating the pan flute. Ba-dum, ba-dum. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, you guys know the the pan flute with all the different reeds. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, one I of, worked one in of, a music store for a year and a half. 
I know. <laughs> One of the things that Pan would often do, Greek god Pan, uh, he, he would cavort around with these things called nymphs, which were kind of like water spirits or, or tree spirits, elemental spirits of different parts of nature. And by cavort, I usually mean he would chase them. Uh, do you guys remember uh, Disney's Hercules? Yeah. Yeah, you remember That's Phil? That's exactly what, well, it, yeah. Yeah. That, it was that one. For some reason in my head, I was thinking Fantasia. Because well, I think there was oh, yeah, a bit in no. Fantasia about You're right. that too. There, there, there is one one of the sequences in Fantasia has all of the. I think it's the one with Chernabog. I don't remember the name. Oh, Night on Bald Mountain is that? Is that the one? I don't know. It's been so long. I can't remember. But you said that, and my mind just went ding. <coughs> that was it. <laughs> if I it, maybe it was Fantasia 2000. I, I'm not. It's been a while since I've seen Fantasia. But there was something with like nymphs, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Frolicking around, but Pan and and. The satyrs. Sometimes he's a satyr in the myth. Sometimes he's not. But they, they would try to chase him, just like Phil in Disney's Hercules. You know, the first time you meet him, he's looking through the hedge, oh, watching yeah. those uh, dr- dryads, which are like a particularly yeah. Greek kind of version of of, of these nymphs. Um, just being creepy, being creepy. Yeah. Well, there, there was this one nymph in particular in the in the story that that Pan starts to get, take a particular interest in and, and starts chasing her, and she runs away. And as he chases her, she dives into the water and, and asks... She either turns herself into a reed or she asks the river god to turn her into one of these reeds to hide from Pan. There's a bunch of reeds there. And so Pan's brilliant idea is to cut them all down to try and figure out which one she is, and it cuts them into the different lengths... And just, just and says, he kind of gets distracted by them and says, hey, I could do something cool with these instead and, and makes the pan flute av- instead of chasing and you know, capturing this, this nymph. So he ended up killing her. Well, see, this is one of the frustrating things about reading <laughs> old myths is that you, it's kind of hard to say uh, because as soon as the pan flute comes in, they kind of stop talking about the nymph. But mm. some, some of the stories, they might have her showing up later on too. I mean, even just to say what Pan is, and, and we're, we'll see this even worse here in a few minutes when we start talking about Iacus. At least mm. with Pan, there's some some continuity with certain yeah. things, with how he appears and what he does. Well, uh, if I am thinking right, Pan was also kind of one of those gods that was associated with rebirth and, like, Oh yeah. Um yeah, just like rebirth and fertility and every, spring. Every spring. And right. uh you know, just never getting old, I suppose, right? Uh, or or getting old and then getting young again. Yeah, yeah. That would be yeah, one one thing like that. It's actually kind of funny. Uh a lot a lot of the depictions of Pan are not going to be safe for work. Uh <laughs> because he's wild, you know, he's a wild man, covered in a lot of hair. If he looks uh, oftentimes he'll at least look like a satyr, which if you we've said that several times, it's a yeah, you know, half man, half goat. Yeah, they're, they're, with they're, like yeah, it's goat legs, goat I guess. legs, cloven hooves, and usually covered with hair all over the place, kind of like a like a goat man. So he you, wouldn't wear clothes, and you would also kind of see that uh, description in if you've ever read Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Oh yeah, Mister Tumnus, yeah, Mister Tumnus, the fawn. Fawn. You call them fawns. There, I don't think they call and them. C.S. Lewis. Yeah, Tolkien's good friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think it's really interesting uh, that he is depicted as a satyr so often because if you look into Greek drama and things of that nature, you have tragedy and comedy, and then the satyr is used to represent tragic comedy. Like you can see it at our local theater here. There's a huge medallion right above the stage, and one side has comedy, one side has tragedy. In the middle, there's just this satyr head. Which looks kind of demonic, doesn't it? It does look kind of demonic. It's got horns. But it was because it was supposed to be mischievous and mm-hmm. um, entertaining. Yeah. Well, and when I say demonic, that's uh, there's a good reason for that. Uh, we <laughs> kind of made a couple of jokes about it, but our Western depiction of the devil, of Satan, has been heavily influenced by the stories of Pan and the satyrs. You know, in, in, because it, when you read... The Bible, you never really get a description of Satan or the devil or whatever you want to call him. I mean, you get some clearly metaphorical ones. Where he's yeah. like a big dragon or, or he's taking on different forms. The beast. Uh, things like that. 
But in, especially in the medieval period, uh, you, you, there were artists who wanted to depict Satan. They wanted to, you know, draw their art and they wanted it to be really clear that it was the devil and not just some guy. And so they were looking for a way to visually represent chaos and sinfulness and wildness and drunkenness. And they go to, to Pan, who's kind of associated with all of those, those things. So when you think of Satan, like think of uh, South Park and, and the, you know, oh, the, the gigantic yeah. red devil with cloven hooves and horns... That, you know, he looks a lot more like Pan than he does look like any character in the Bible. Uh, but you recognize that, vi- and you immediately can know, oh, okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's Satan. Going back a couple episodes to uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, when uh, Tommy sells his soul to the devil, they ask him to describe him. And, of course, uh, the protagonist is like, well, he's got cloven hooves and a bifurcated tail and... You know, all these different things. Um, that is the classic description that we're going for with this satyr look, even though that Tommy says, no, nah, that's not it. But that's that's what we all associate with. Yeah, regardless of your religious background or not, like that's kind of the Western. I mean, you, when, when Satan comes on the screen in South Park, you know, you know Satan. that it's Satan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even when he's talking a little different than Satan often talks. Uh, so... In Peter Pan, you can see some pretty easy parallels with this, too, how Pan is this wild boy, right? He, he, uh, he doesn't have cloven hooves, but he's got this mangy hair that's kind of must and, and filled with dirt and things because he's living out in the forest all the time. Yeah. And um, but some of, one of the descriptions that Barry has of him in the book is that, that he talks about how he has the devil in him how he's mischievous and he's playing tricks on Hook and things like that. Uh, very, very similar to the way that, that Pan would do his business. Well, yeah. I think that's really interesting that he describes Peter in that way because this is uh, the early 1900s. They're coming off of all of the um, stigma, I guess I'll say, of the Victorian era where everybody was very, you know, Oh, oh, sully these lily white hands with the devil's own work. No, thank you. Uh, everyone was kind of um, prim and proper. So yeah. having a protagonist of your story that has the devil in him is a radical thought in that time yeah, period. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then he's he's the one that's kind of, uh, I guess, tempting the Darling family to leave the uh, society's norms and grow up and be a proper lady. So, I mean, he, he is kind of fulfilling that character mark that devil on the shoulder that, kind of exactly role. Yeah. come to neverland you'll never grow up there i won't allow you to grow up there <laughs> and, and when they get there they're doing the sorts of things that you often see pan and the satyrs do in greek myths i mean they would have these wild drunken parties in the forest they would run into town and carry women away forcefully to join seven their parties for seven brothers uh, <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> And, and so when Peter takes them to Neverland and, uh, you know, they're dancing around with, uh, like Tiger Lily and, and the people there, it, it's going to be kind of similar. And, and, you know, they're having parties out in this wild place that isn't their safe nursery bed. But, uh, one of the other Greek gods that gets associated with Pan frequently, Pan's kind of the god of the, the wild, but the god of wine is a guy named Dionysus. Yeah. You like Dionysus? Yeah. <laughs> he's got a... <laughs> he's got a track record. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a complicated guy, too. There, there's a few different stories. It looks like there might actually be more than one Dionysus, even, in Greek mythology, because uh, there's different tales about who his parents are and, and exactly what he does. But mm-hmm. the Dionysus that we often think of as the god of wine is the son of Zeus and, and a human woman who would have wild parties out, out in the forest. Um, he, he makes a, or I think he calls him Bacchus, but Lewis has Bacchus out in the forest at mm-hmm. one point in, in mm-hmm. one of the Chronicles of Narnia books. And, and so Pan and Dionysus, you know, they, they, you know, they'd be the kind of guys partying together out there. Just two bros hanging out. That's right. <laughs> and Bobby, you said earlier that you're, you're talking about fertility rights and, and, and things like that. One of the more famous elements of Greek mythology in that regard is something called the Eleusinian Mysteries. And 
Greek religion is this, it's kind of like Western religion now. It's really complicated and it takes a long time to explain. And unless you're a member of one of these groups, you're probably not going to really understand it in an, you know, completely through anyway. But we, you know, we, we do our best. The Eleusinian Mysteries were this cult, don't, but don't think like Jim Jones or, or one of, like, not cult like that sense. No Kool-Aid cult. No, not, a, not a Kool-Aid cult. Just cult yeah. in the sense that it was a, a religion that had a lot of rites and practices and things that you would have to go through to initiate yourself into deeper and deeper levels of the mysteries. The Eleusinian mysteries circled around stories of the, the goddesses Demeter and Persephone who were the, the goddesses of the seasons, and Persephone was kind of the queen of the underworlds. You guys yeah. know the story of Demeter? You remember that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where uh, she has to go back to Hades for three months out of every year, and that's when we have winter. and Yeah. Yeah, so the Eleusinian Mysteries, you're kind of reenacting that, where, where Demeter is really sad because her daughter's in the underworld for three months. Because Do you want to you tell that story? I, I, I guess I could tell the story. Because that's a really <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, so Hades, uh, god of the underworld, goes to Zeus because he sees Persephone picking flowers, and he's like, hey, she's hot. I really like her. Can I marry her? I know that she's your daughter, but I wanted to get... Which means she's my niece. Yeah, which, which means that it's Hades' niece, yeah. And uh, it's like, I want to marry that. <laughs> and it sounds bad, but only it because it bad, is. Because it is. <laughs> um, and so he goes to her and basically steals her away. And Demeter comes back and says, or sees, whoa, where is my daughter? She was stolen away by Hades to go to the underworld. And there was a little bit of a, like a, a catch, you know, that she was able to leave the underworld but she would never be able to leave fully if she had ever had any food in down there. And so she does not eat for a long time, and everybody's freaking out because it's winter. Zeus is like, well, maybe I screwed up because <laughs> winter kind of sucks. And so goes to Demeter and says, hey, we'll bring your daughter back. But not before Persephone eats like a handful of pomegranate seeds, of course, she goes back up to the uh, up to her mom, Demeter, and was like, "Hey, thank you for getting me out." Demeter is like, "No problem." Oh crap! You just had food down there, didn't you? And so that's why we have to have three months of winter because for every uh, year, Persephone has to make it down to Hades and be basically the queen of the underworld for three months. So that's a very quick nutshell version of that story in Greek mythology. Demeter is basically the ultimate helicopter parent, right? Because she can't <laughs> go without seeing her daughter. And, and, and because she's like the goddess of crops or something yeah. like that. Um, goddess goddess agriculture. Of, of and... agric okay. So yeah, when she's sad, all the agriculture dies. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we have winter. So in the Eleusinian Mysteries, you're going through different rites and different rituals and things to put yourself in the place of one of these different characters and doing all all sorts of different things um somewhere around the well the, fir the first reference we have to a, a new character that pops up in the story somewhere around the fifth century bc but it really seems to have, have come in uh, by the first century bc there's a character named iacus and Iacus kind of looks like Dionysus, uh, but it's not really clear. In a lot of depictions of Demeter and Persephone, Iacus is going to be sitting on their laps because he's a kid. He's a little boy. Uh, and and, and it, his name comes from part of one of the rituals where they would, sh they would shout, you know, Iake, Iake, uh, which is kind of difficult to translate. But uh, it, over time, it seems like that, that cry took on its own personality in the story and sometimes Iacus is described as, uh, as another one of Demeter's children sometimes he's described as one of Persephone's children in some stories he's one of their husbands I mean it, there's a there's a lot of different people telling these stories using the same names but the stories are always different yeah and there's so always hard. variations and yeah. it seems like that's one of the reasons we have this podcast exactly <laughs> gives us <laughs> lots to talk about but it looks like Iacus is very there's a lot of overlap with Dionysus um, in, in a lot of the ways that his stories go. 
And the the phrase that Ovid uses, Ovid is this late first century um, poet, Greek poet, that we get a lot of our information about Greek mythology from, like from his book, The Metamorphoses. He uses a phrase, the, uh, the puer eternatus, to describe Iacus. And, and, and that phrase, puer eternatus, means eternal boy. That Iacus is this boy that doesn't grow up. That he is involved with Dionysus, who is involved with Pan, uh, who is involved in this whole process of the wild changing every year, but never really changing completely because, you know, this was before anybody wanted to talk about climate change. <laughs> and when Barry sits down to write his story about a, a wild boy who never grows up, I mean, he's, he's got a lot of material from Greek mythology to work with. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So we, we've got Pan figured out, but there's uh, another main character that we haven't even touched on yet, and that would be Tinkerbell, the <laughs> Tinkerbell. fairy. Hey, Tink. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I know everybody's heard of fairies. I, that's one of those things that's kind of, like, ingrained at Halloween time. You see little girls dressed up with fairy wings. And, and every uh, so often little boys. And, yeah. Um, and it's, there's it's, nothing w- wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, we all know about fairies but i mean there's there's a lot that goes into fairy history i guess and uh the tales that kind of create those depictions i guess when you think of a fairy what do you think of like what what's the image that comes to mind what do they look like lately tinkerbell (laughs) yeah (laughs) the the fairies um is tinkerbell the queen of the fairies i'm so out of it with wings and then um Pixie dust for sure, because you know glitter everywhere. Oh, God, glitter! So much days. glitter. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, my traditional thought of fairies is the same. It's mm. it's Tinkerbell because you know the magical world of Disney. You always have Tinkerbell flying Opening. over and bing. Oh, that's right. Right above the castle, and uh, fun okay, fun bit of trivia there. You know how they'll have. At Disney World, they'll, they'll have Tinkerbell fly out over the audience on the oh, castle. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that role is not always, but often played by, by a guy. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, not always, but huh. um, it's not uncommon for that to happen. So it sounds like the exact opposite of Peter Pan on Broadway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mary Martin. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the role is far enough away from the audience that people don't tend to notice. Yeah. Huh. No, I, I get that. But uh, anyway... Um, but yeah, how about you? What do you think of when you hear fairies? Well, I mean, yeah, I grew, I grew up with, with Tinkerbell. I, I was never, uh, I, I never went crazy for Tinkerbell. Some people really, really like her, you know, get, get Hence tattooed. all of the Tinkerbell movies and spinoffs. Oh, that's right. Yeah. All now, of that jazz. Oh, tell me about it. My daughters go crazy for Pixie Hollow. It's, it's where yeah, all the fun's at. Yeah. You're, you're the only one with. <laughs> daughters and children in general so oh, yeah, I got that uh, you know more about it than we do i'm sure <laughs> and more than i care to but hey <laughs> tinkerbell is uh you, know, you said pixie dust uh, tinkerbell is a good example of a pixie like this tiny little fairy but um a, a lot of times especially in european folklore i mean you'll you see pretty much any kind of European folk tale is going to have some basis for a fairy kind of creature in it. But a lot of times they are much more fearsome. They're big. They're magical. They're the kinds of things that you don't want to mess with. Uh, Whether you want to talk about um, characters out of Arthurian legend um, characters like Queen Mab and, and the fairy's midwife, uh, or, or characters from Shakespeare, from a, a Midsummer Night's Dream, like Oberon and Titania, who are like the, the king and queen of the fairies. Uh, they are far more interesting than just these, these tiny little fireflies that cause mischief. Uh, th- these are elemental forces of nature that you besmirch at your peril. Yeah, and I feel like Shakespeare has got a ton of fairies. The fair folk. Yeah, the fair folk. But Shakespeare has a lot of them. And like like we said, Queen Mab. And I feel like that's where we get a really good description of what a fairy or a pixie kind of looks like. She 
is described by Mercutio and Romeo and Juliet uh, in really great detail. You know, how she rides in the shell of like a hazelnut and she has two gnats as horses that drag it along. So, that I mean, it's a really good. Adorable. <laughs> it's a great depiction of like the size and just kind of gives you an idea of what the traditional fairy looks like. And I think that's where we get the image of uh, Tinkerbell. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're supposed to be beautiful uh, when when Bottom falls asleep in a Midsummer Night's Dream and, and he wakes up and, and he's you know he's surrounded by all of these uh, amazing creatures. He, he he thinks he's it's almost like he's died and gone to heaven and he thinks he's surrounded by angels. Uh, uh, but this is I mean, granted his his head's been turned into a, a donkey, donkey's head. So <laughs> they're they're very powerful creatures. You know, they're magical um, in, in the most fearsome kind of way. I mean, magic, we, I know we, think, we might think of magic as like this thing that kids learn about a, at, at a wonderful school that you get to by a train. But uh, especially in, in Shakespeare's day, you know, ma- magic is this, it's like uh, electricity or, or nuclear power. I mean, it's this really it's, powerful it's raw. thing. raw. Raw energy yeah. that you don't want to mess with. And, um, I mean, if you look at, at some of the stories, uh, like out of Scotland, you, you, they'll have entire political structures where you have different courts of fairies, the, the seely and the unseely courts, and they, they go to war with each other, and they, they each have their own interests, and if you are allied with one, then you're against the other, uh, but you can never really be allied with one because they're they're these creatures that are very fickle and out for themselves. You always have to be very careful. Uh, you never want to make a deal with a fairy because fairies are smarter than you. And they it's kind of like the stories in Arabian Nights about genies. You have to be excruciatingly clear and specific with your words because fairies are master wordsmiths. And they will catch you and they will come up with every loophole they can to win and get the better of you in any kind of promise or or bargain or anything like that and you see that across cultures even in the irish uh folk tales and fairy stories you hear about them people making deals with the fair folk and them not going very well (laughs) (laughs) well and that's another thing is i feel like fairies is just a really general term uh because if you go to yeah back to irish folklore and legends you have um the fair folk who I mean, there's tons of different uh, variations. I mean, you have leprechauns, yes. you have banshees, you have dullahans, yes. you have yes. um, yeah, all these different types, and you have to be like careful because a lot of them are not like the friendly. They will mess you up. Yeah, they're not the friendly like Tinkerbells. They're they're the ones that will like kidnap your child and leave a dying fairy in its place you know the whole changeling stories and even uh, if you just walk past their homes and and you aren't respectful or if you step on a blade of their grass or something then they'll come uh you know torture you in the night it's it's crazy i mean they're not friendly little beings yeah they're not friendly little beings at all and in fact some people say that fairies can only be good or bad. <laughs> they can be both good and bad. There's just not enough room for two emotions at the same time. <laughs> um, I work with children. Uh, I know that sometimes people are surprised by Tinkerbell in Peter Pan because she is cold. Yeah, she's, she's, she's not exactly benign. Uh, she, I thought you were going to say hot-headed, which was... Well, she doesn't thing, care. She, but, like, but the, the kids, the darling children are in danger, and she's just kind of shrugging her shoulders and saying, yeah, good. I don't like them anyway. <laughs> uh, that, that fits. I mean, that fits very comfortably into general fairy lore. Um, that would be the attitude of a lot of fairies towards a lot of humans. I mean, if we're useful for entertainment, then, you know, so be it, like in A Midsummer Night's Dream. But for the most part... They got their own thing going on. They don't need us. Yeah. Tinkerbell don't need Wendy. In fact, she actively tries to get rid of Wendy. <laughs> yeah. A <laughs> Wendy is... bird? <laughs> well, Peter said kill it. <laughs> yeah. So we're like, oh, wow, that's uh, that's pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the, the, the darker moments in the book. Um, I think it's Toodles. I had – oh, yeah, Toodles. Yeah, Somebody's I, missing Tuttles. Toodle, I think Toodles um, – 
accidentally he's the one that accidentally almost kills Wendy, like shoots her with a with an arrow. And he starts begging Peter to kill him as like retribution. Like, please, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. Just kill me now, just kill me now. <laughs> like, like you're seven. Why are you talking like this? <laughs> yeah, don't cut my arm off. <laughs> just kill me. Yeah. Ugh. Um Yeah, that's and it's it's possible, I mean, when you look at the that kind of brutality, as Christianity spread throughout Europe, uh, and you could see this happening in other parts of the world too, it's been suggested that maybe some of these stories about fairies might be a way that local people kept some of their cultural traditions alive in the wake of Christianity coming in. Uh, okay, so you've been worshiping this local spirit or you've had these practices for a long time. Well, now you worship this God, but we still recognize that there's this spirit out there. It's just now, now we're going to call it a fairy or we're going to call it a, a, a Dullahan or we're going to call it, in other parts of the world, you know, they, they might talk about demons or, or other kinds of creatures, but it, it's a way of, of, of these ideas kind of being preserved in, in the yeah. traditions. A lot of them turned into their own Christian myths, like... That's St. Patrick yeah. driving the snakes out of Ireland. <laughs> yeah. And there were uh, never snakes in Ireland. There were never snakes in Ireland. But I mean it's a lot of it is uh just to keep the tradition, the stories, the identity alive. And it's something that has certainly influenced uh pop culture more broadly now. I mean the when you have fairies with wings then it makes sense that they'll be flying. But a lot of the fairies don't necessarily fly. Like they never uh, that <laughs> Titania and Oberon aren't aren't flying around the stage in a Midsummer Night's Dream. I don't. Uh, I've never heard of a leprechaun really like bursting into flight. Oh, I thought you were going to say bursting into song. That's to say, well, well, that might it's not happen. A Disney movie. So uh, Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Oh gosh. But uh, today, when you when you think of fairies. And and well, I get, maybe it's um, Peter Pan more more generally. One of the things that people love about Peter Pan is his ability to fly. Right? He, he has the pixie dust, and he has faith and trust. Well, he's the only one that doesn't need the pixie dust to fly, because he's just that cool. Yeah, he he's, just he does never he never has bad thoughts. Maybe he's always happy, like a kid. They're yeah. always happy because oh. they're oblivious to the horrible things in the world around them. That they might be doing themselves. <laughs> that they might actually be responsible for. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the uh, that that image of of a boy flying around. Um, Steven Spielberg. He was the one that directed Hook. And Hook. If you haven't seen Hook, it came out in 1991, right? It's basically an attempt at a sequel to Peter and Wendy, where Robin Williams plays. Peter Pan, all grown up, he has left Neverland, and he he got stuck in the in the normal world, and he grew up into an adult, and he forgot about his time as Peter Pan. He got married to Wendy's granddaughter, great granddaughter. It's something, like, something that. like that. The uh, what happened was he kept going back to visit Wendy, and Wendy kept getting older and having kids, and so on and so forth. To where he finally said, "Hey, I think I'm going to stay this time." And becomes part of the family. Yeah. And you know who it is in the movie that... Uh, oh, wait, no. I can't remember if she plays his wife or if she plays Winnie. But, but Gwyneth Paltrow is the one in the movie. <laughs> who, she's like the, the beautiful young Wendy. But anyway, um, the, the whole point of the movie is that Captain Hook comes and kidnaps Peter Pan's children and, and carries them off into Neverland. And so... Peter Pan has to go, and it, what, his name's Peter Sullivan. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, what it it's is. something Peter like that. something. But um, Peter has to go back to Neverland and remember who he really is. And and Tinkerbell is there, played by Julia Roberts, and mm-hmm. uh, and and convinces him that it's all true. And he even has to go back and convince the the Lost Boys that it's really That's him, right? Yeah, and, and and he has to learn how to fly again. Steven Spielberg was the guy who made that movie. He, he was the director. He, he argues that any kind of character who flies around is dependent on Peter Pan in some way. Like Spielberg specifically mentioned Superman, that when he 
when Spielberg was a kid and saw Superman, he immediately associated that with Peter Pan. Really? And, and I, th- I, th- I think he's on to something. I mean, that's a very Story Cauldron-esque kind of idea, right? That you've got uh, the, these people who shouldn't be able to fly. Like, there's no explanation for it. They don't have wings. They don't have rocket packs or any kind of technology. They're just floating around. Just, yeah. It's a, it is a looming question as to how Superman gets to fly faster. Uh, it's not like he's beating his wings any harder or anything, but it, but it, he does. It, you know, you just kind of go with it because he's Superman. You just kind of go with it because he's Peter Pan. Mm-hmm. So I have a question. You recently then, or your family recently read an unabridged version of J.M. Barry's Peter Pan. Did it end with Captain Hook getting eaten by a crocodile after Peter literally kicks him off of the ship? Oh, oh yeah, it's pretty bloody. And then does your version also have um, When Wendy Grew Up, an afterthought? Yes, yeah, it does. Yeah, that was an added chapter that yeah. Barry put in later on to kind of... It's, ac- it's actually re- really similar to the starting idea for Hook. Gotcha. Um, where Peter goes back routinely to, um, to see Wendy as, and then meets Jane. Um, which is what Finding Neverland was based off of in 2003, which was Disney's attempt at a Peter Pan suit. Uh, oh, right, yeah, because Hook... Well, was Hook not... I don't remember if Hook was Disney. Was that Finding Neverland, or was that... Hmm? Okay, That was the Finding one with Johnny Neverland. Depp, right? Finding Neverland? It was animated. Oh. Oh, oh yeah, the, the Peter Pan 2, that was yeah, the... Yeah, where he takes... Oh. During World War II, when he takes Jane to Neverland. Was that the direct-to-video sequel that I never saw? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. There were, okay, we gotta we gotta get this straight here because there was a, a live so action movie. There's so many adaptations of it. Right. That's starting oh, to get difficult. Return to Neverland. Oh, Return to Neverland. Okay, Finding Neverland. That's the live action oh, one yeah. about J M Barry, where creepy character master Johnny, uh, Depp. Johnny Depp plays <laughs> Barry. That's right. And it and it kind of goes in through his biography, but. Yeah. See, sorry. I'm no, not, that's uh, Return to Neverland. I didn't. I've never saw Return to Neverland. I haven't Neverland. written down Return to Neverland, but my pen was covering it up. <laughs> so it, it goes through Jane's story. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's fun. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's plenty other adaptations of Peter Pan as well. Oh, and and Tolkien. I can't. Oh, I can't go by without mentioning. You that. have to mention something Tolkien. Of course, because Tolkien uh, spoke very highly of Barry's play. He saw Barry's stage play or a rendition of it, and he appreciated. It. And he actually mentions Peter Pan a couple of times in non fairy stories. Um, and it's been suggested, and I think it's you know it's it's a really fair suggestion to make that Tolkien's idea of the undying elves depends on some of the same root material. Not necessarily Peter Pan, because the elves are not de- definitely not children, but the, uh, the, the the wider fairy lore that we were talking about, much much more like Shakespeare's idea of fairies, like Queen Mab. Yeah, yeah. That's where you're going to be getting the, the ideas um, of Elrond and Galadriel. But, I mean, what what's the most famous line that I think that Peter Pan ever says... Um, in the book, at least, is to to die would be an awfully big adventure. That's mm. a gigantic part of the Elvish storyline throughout Middle Earth is, is that they're wanting to return back to the lands ac- uh, across the sea to basically die and leave Middle Earth forever. Yeah, which is, uh, I mean, that's like the final frontier. So, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, back to Shakespeare, very nice. <laughs> and Star Trek. <laughs> um <laughs> So what do you feel about those that say Peter Pan is kind of a a reaper? Oh, are you talking about the the theory that um, Peter Pan is the angel that takes children that die to heaven? Yes. Oh, it makes me sad. I, yeah, I'd talk about childhood ruined. Is that like you, like you don't like the concept? I'm just like, oh, we're just watching a movie about a bunch of dead kids. <laughs> well, it's really, really sad when you just stop to think about it. I don't think it's as good of a story. Like, it, I don't think that that is at all accurate to what Barry was doing. Um, and if it is, the story becomes worse. I don't yeah. think it's as good of a story. Well, I think it's also just when you're a kid or even now, you still are like, well... What if there really is a place called Never Neverland that's the second past the second start of the right and straight on till morning? Like, and that's a great line. I have to say, that's a wonderful bit of of geography. <laughs> I'm serious. I really that's 
But go ahead, sorry. But it's kind of like you, you like to hold on to that thought that maybe it really could exist. Yeah, yeah. If they, if they just give this analogy, oh, well, this is just an allegory for death, it, it loses some of that possibility of reality. I mean, it's, it, it's exactly what, what Tolkien talks about in On Fairy Stories, that you can't do that. In fact, he would say it, if you ever, he had a very technical definition for a fairy story um, where it has to be treated realistically. Like if, if they wake up at the end and it was all just a dream, then it, it's not a fairy story. It's a fine story. It's just not taking place in this magical other world. Sorry, Wizard there. of Oz. Yeah, sorry, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and I like the ending of Peter Pan, how there's that hint that the dad may have had his own adventures with Peter Pan and had just forgotten about it. Um, that, that helps to give more realistic credibility to the, to the kind of the fantasy. Well, and originally it was Mrs. Darling that had that um, connection with Peter Pan and uh, the pirate ship and all that mm. beforehand. In J.M. Barry's original story, you can tell there's a little bit of connection between Mrs. Darling and Peter Pan, where Disney took it and turned Ooh. it into Mr. Darling uh, having the that. same... Uh, Probably because if he was a boy that went to Neverland, he was never coming back because he was the lost boy, not uh, the mother figure. Well. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. And then if you think about it that way, um, that could be how Mrs. Darling has all the stories because mm. she had been to Neverland mm. with Peter Pan. That sort of thing. Mm, very nice. Very nice. But it's just something that J.M. Barry alludes to. He never actually um, comes out and s- straight up says it. And even if you do a little bit more research into it, you see how Peter keeps his promise even after leaves Wendy and promises to come back every year or whatever it is. She grows up and has kids. He comes back and visits Jane. And mm-hmm. then after Jane grows up and has kids, he comes back and visits her daughter, Margaret. So it's just kind of like this cycle just a that big keeps going. Chain, you know, going. he's like, I wonder if that's... <laughs> no, that, see, yeah, and that makes me think of Peter Pan almost like a family curse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they can't get rid of. Peter generation. Pan's actually a banshee who... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Follows this one family until they die. So, um, yeah, that's that's a good point. Like, it's just it's cyclical, and he's just constantly harassing this one family. Well, and in the original, doesn't uh, don't all the Lost Boys come with Wendy, and the yeah. Darling family adopts all of them? Yeah, and they, then Wendy eventually Peter's marries about Toodles. It. It's suggested. I think th- he did a couple of different drafts, but yeah. Toodles like becomes a judge, I think, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, Peter's really angry about it that that all the Lost Boys leave. I, yeah, I can imagine that was he's his. Lost uh, all his playmates. Could you blame him if he's chopping them into bits just to fit to a right? tree? <laughs> Surprised it didn't. I like the theory, uh, and this is not really. I don't think it, this is really hinted at, but I, I like the theory that Captain Hook and the pirates are escaped Lost Boys. Oh, the, and the, you know, they, like they got free of Peter's tyranny. They escaped. You know, they got too old, so he was going to kill him. But they escaped and became and pirates. Became pirates for some reason. That's just not really explained. But and it'd be a whole different story if that's how Hook lost his hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If he's like, well, he couldn't fit, so I cut off his hand. <laughs> I, I, with all of the live action remakes that Disney is doing, I would love for a live action remake of Peter Pan but done in the Maleficent style where it's focused on Captain Hook. Yes. As a, as the protagonist. That would be cool. You get a little mm. backstory on him. That would be brilliant. And or it could be, it could be really cool. Yeah. And Smee is, that would be his, great. His, uh, life partner in some way or another. <laughs> <laughs> I like Smee. Well, what would you, uh, what would you change about the movie? Oh, what would I change? It's one of those that's like so ingrained. There's, there's at least one thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're thinking. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's one of those movies that's so ingrained in our pop culture and all that. But yes, one thing that I would probably change is the representation of the native people of Neverland. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, oh, right. which I, I, it's kind of funny because we just came off of this run of Peter Pan Jr., and they have changed the words to what makes the red man red. No, they changed it from what makes well, yeah, the red man red. From what makes the red man to what makes the brave man brave. 
Um, Anamanaganda. Yeah. Oh, God. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it is, uh, you know, kind of like a, a step in that direction. But man, the cartoon characters <laughs> that in that movie, that's. I mean, and I know there are going to be people who want to defend it by saying, well, it's 1953. What do you expect? I'm like, well, that's an explanation. That's not an excuse. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an explanation as to why, or like, the cultural insensitivity. It makes me feel bad to be white. Stereotypes. <laughs> uh, I mean, it is something that uh, we, we should not just sweep under the rug, right, and say, yeah, th- this is something that in a lot of ways for a long time, um, this was just kind of taken as normal. And it's not the only uh, Disney movie to do this. Arguably, it's not even the worst Disney movie in terms of insensitive representations of race. But uh, Song of the South, anyone? You know? mm, yeah. Right? They don't even allow that one out anymore. Right, no. <laughs> but uh, it's nice. T- I think it's, it's good to, to see maybe some of the, the attempts to change it, although I, I really don't know if you could sanitize the Native American representation in this movie without removing it completely. Just because they're only in it to be a caricature. To, yeah. To like... Yeah. To to do the dance and to to be an object for Peter to rescue, Tiger Lily in the 1953 movie never even speaks. Yeah, no, but she that's, sure does kiss Peter. Yeah, like that's her only role in the movie is to make the is other female character jealous. That and to be the damsel in distress. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so that that was another thing that they changed in the stage play. Now, not only does Tiger Lily have more of a role, but, but they, she is like the guardian figure. <laughs> guardian figure, and she add, they add that whole stanza in Hanumanaganda about the brave girl. Yeah, what makes, makes the brave girl brave? And there's this nice little interaction between Tiger Lily and Wendy about why do boys always take credit for everything? <laughs> and so it, it's it's a step, but I, I I I think that there are some things, you know, there there is, I think it's Looney Tunes. I think it's Looney Tunes that um, you can bring some of the same criticisms you know, oh, against definitely their, yeah. some of the, some of their things. Of the period. When they play some of those cartoons now, they have a disclaimer. And they'll, they, yeah. they'll say, we're not going to change this because we don't want to pretend like it never happened. But we also don't want to just play this as if this isn't a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I think that Peter Pan should probably be treated in that kind of regard and say, look, changing it is going to completely change the movie. So instead, recognize that this is... A, a good example of a bad thing that used to be like, exceedingly prevalent. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I, even as I say a good example of a bad thing, I'm thinking about just how kind of pathetic that, that sounds because it's still, <laughs> I mean. I just, I don't want to yeah. touch this issue with a 10-foot pole. So. Yeah, to be honest. Which yeah. is exactly why, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I understand. We don't, want, we don't want the podcast to get too political. <laughs> that's, that's not what people are here to hear. Um, so but still, we should think about it. Yeah. Is Think there anything it. else that you would <laughs> want to change? Michael Jackson. <coughs> what? <laughs> Neverland. What? Uh, I don't know. As far as the movie goes. I'm really sad that Catherine Beaumont won't be able to be Wendy now because, well, she was the original Wendy. So. Yeah. She just she did such a good job. <laughs> I think I would have liked the mermaids to be more involved, too. Yeah, I, 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 because the mermaids yeah. are that kind of element of the story that you kind of forget about too. Uh, Very at least true. I do, and they're going back to the stories about Pan and the water nymphs and things like that. I, I think we can see some correlation there. Yeah, that they should be more involved. I think. Yeah, but again, especially in the '53 version, they're there f- to look pretty. Basically. Yeah, they're right. the they're the high school girls. Yeah, yeah. there is Hello, fan Peter. club. <laughs> Peter's fan club. What about you, Bob? Would you change anything? Um, you know that that glaringly obvious one. I, I can't say that I would really change anything because it's so steeped in our pop culture, and it's one of, like I said, one of the first things that I rem- watched. I'm sure, and it was just constantly around. That it's kind of a rock that is just there you can't really change it because it's part of the foundation so that's that's where i'm coming from but um we're coming up on the end so uh 
who would you recommend this movie to? All the people. I All the people. Yeah, I think kids especially. I mean, it, it's a really short movie. It, it is yeah. rather short. So it doesn't uh, take take long to get through. <laughs> I don't know. I watched it a couple weeks ago, and I was like, oh, still, it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hook is, even though Steven Spielberg really hates that movie, apparently, I think Hook is a really fun movie to watch. Oh, definitely. Um, it might be more of a guilty pleasure just because I, I was a kid when I first saw it, so and I should probably try and watch it more objectively. <laughs> Maybe it is a bad movie. It's just a really fun movie to watch. It is fun. That, it's this, very entertaining. The whole scene at the dinner table where they're imagining their dinner into existence is, yeah. man, I wish I could do that. With the imaginary food fight. The imaginary food <laughs> fight, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. But uh, I, th- I think that it's a, it's, it's a fun family movie. The book... If if you are going to read the book with your kids, just be prepared to explain what an orgy is, because uh, the the fairies, some of the fairies come back from an orgy, and we got to talk about a you know like ah oh, it's just it's a they just came back from a party don't worry about it, uh, <laughs> so, but uh, just just know that that there are little things like that in there, but at the same time the book is not it's not overtly graphic. Like it doesn't go on. It's not like reading the song of ice and fire game of Thrones series or anything like that. It doesn't go on and on about blood when (laughs) Peter's killing things, which is probably good for a kid's book. But, but it is, it is much like the brothers grim fairy tales in that people, people die. And and that's a part of the story. And, Hmm. um, you know, the crocodile is an actual danger. He's not just a kind of a cartoonish character that ticks. Yeah. Uh, so well i that brings us to the end of the hour but uh i would like to thank you for joining us today on the story cauldron the music for this episode is from the band hook sounds and you can find us all over instagram and facebook and twitter just search for story cauldron or the story cauldron and that's going to be our website too the story cauldron.com yeah and you can go to the website if you want to see anything about us personally some dumb pictures possibly (laughs) um and then also go and rate us on itunes and give us a review it helps people find us and it makes us feel pretty good about ourselves that people actually want to listen to us talk (laughs) give us all those warm happy thoughts that we need to fly (laughs) exactly but until next time i hope you enjoyed this and bye. bye